Cord. Welcome everybody. I'm Charles Shapiro, President of World Affairs Council. Today's program is with Allison Vidia Goodman, Vice President of the Southern Region of ADL and a member of the World Affairs Council. This program is part of our Women's Leadership Month. We've been asking women leaders to talk about their own jobs and challenges as well as feminine leadership issues. Today's program is brought to you by you, the members of the World Affairs Council and the UPS Foundation. Got a number of board members on the program today, Asma wow. Farid and Sam Owens and our board chair, Bernard Taylor. We've also got former speakers, Edvi Jean-Francois and Dr. Robin Morris, as well as Christina Liao from the National Association of Chinese Americans. Welcome to all of you. Allison Padilla Goodman is Vice President of the Southern Division of the ADL, and the ADL stands for Anti-Defamation League, but their name is ADL, not Anti-Defamation League. Allison joined ADL in 2014 as the Regional Director of its New Orleans office. In 2017, she became Director of the Atlanta office. This past year, Vice President of the Southern Region of ADL. She earned a BA from Middlebury College, her master's from Tulane and her PhD from the City University of New York. Her academic work focused on racial identities and othering. So Allison, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here today. This is so cool. Thanks so much for having me. It's great yeah. to meet you. Yeah, and I want everybody to know we planned this and scheduled it before the shootings in Atlanta last yeah. week. So. Uh, unfortunate, unfortunately, I mean, gosh, it, this becomes more relevant. Let me let me start off with the, just what is the ADL and what do y'all do? Sure. So ADL is a century old anti hate organization. We've been around since 1913 and our mission has been the same since 1913, which is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. Uh, we fight anti Semitism and hatred in many different forms through you know, robust education programming in schools and in communities, um, a strong advocacy agenda on issues like hate crimes, um, marriage equality, religious freedom, and um, very strong investigative work on anti-Semitic incidents, hate crimes, hate incidents, extremist groups, uh, both online and on the ground across okay, the country. Okay, so hate crimes against Jews or hate crimes against in, in any group in the U.S.? against any group in the US. All of our programming, you know, we come from, uh, we are an organization with Jewish values rooted in Jewish traditions that understands that uh, you can't fight anti-Semitism or frankly, any ism in a vacuum that, um, you know, people who hate are generally equal opportunity haters and we're all in this together. And we can't live in a world without anti-Semitism that doesn't also kind of stand up against homophobia and xenophobia and racism. Um, and so we work on these issues very holistically. I was listening to a podcast this morning with Representative Andy Kim from New Jersey. And he was talking about his five-year-old being bullied in kindergarten and a kid calling him China boy. And him, you know, just I mean, struggling to how do you explain to your child? You hear so many similar stories from racial and ethnic minorities in the US. And I'm sure you experienced some of that when you were growing up, like a whole bunch of us did. Is that othering? You, you did your academic work in othering. What is othering? Where does it come from? Why is that? seem almost like a like a something that's built in yeah you know at adl we've kind of tracked anti-semitism over the decades we've looked at hate crimes we look at um issues and and historically even before the dates of our tracking we can see that in times of economic insecurity political instability social and national instability um, those are the moments when we see anti-Semitism rise. Um, we've seen that historically, we see that now. Um, and so, you know, in these moments right now where we are certainly living in times of instability, um, you know, based on the pandemic, based on our kind of political existence, 
based on the defining of our kind of national identity, um, we are definitely seeing othering of all kinds increase. And so, you know, the Stop AAPI Hate has been tracking the kind of hate incidents against the AAPI community. We've seen 3,800 incidents just in the year of the pandemic of being home. We've seen uh, the rates of anti-Semitism right now are just out of the roof. Um, our, we do an audit of anti-Semitic incidents each year that looks at incidents of harassment, assault, and vandalism that people are reporting to us. Um, and the number of incidents is double what it was just five years ago. Um, so, you know, hate crimes, we can look at hate crimes. I mean, hate crimes, we've seen a tremendous increase at 33% increase in, in just about six years kind of nationwide. So we're living in these times where this instability is just really spilling out onto the street and people like um, the person you heard on the podcast this morning, uh, it impacts everywhere. I, I wish I could say that that story is unique, uh, but frankly, we've been dealing with uh, just enormous amount of hatred and, and incidents of bullying and, and discrimination in K-12 schools um, with students trying to make sense of the world outside and not really understanding how to do so correctly. Um, so we understand that like these problems have to really be confronted from all angles together uh, which is why we do the kind of education with the civil rights advocacy and the investigative work. Is 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 there a definition of othering? Uh, definition of othering. Um, yes, I don't have it off the top of my hand, but I think when we're thinking of othering, we're thinking of um, you know creating the 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 opposite of you right the per the people or the the identities that you want to classify as other as separate from you as foreign as um as something that needs to be feared and concerned and is it that othering that leads to discriminate in children that leads to sure. discrimination and hatred yeah and adults? yeah so at ADL, we talk about how hatred escalates. Um, and at the bottom, you know, we talk about bias generally, that we all have bias. We don't necessarily use the, the, the context of othering. We use the framework of bias. And bias is something universal. Everyone has bias. You may prefer mm -hmm. smart people to stupid people or tall people to short people or whatever. Um, bias is universal. Bias is learned, and so bias can be unlearned. Um, and we describe the escalation of hate in the form of a pyramid. We have this pyramid of hate. You can Google it on our website if you want. At the bottom rung is the kind of like everyday bias that people have. And then if you move up, it's that bias becoming internalized into beliefs and prejudices. So, you know, I may um, believe that. Um, that uh, you know, I may believe in one kind of bias and then I actually start to think it and start to act on it. And that prejudice then moves up into institutionalized discrimination, whether that be economic or housing or, or whatnot kind of discrimination. And, and in the cases that that's not checked, that then moves up into hate crimes. And in the rare incidents of the hate crimes piece isn't addressed, then we see genocide. And we talk about how people, everyday people, can confront bias at the bottom rungs and not let it escalate. So when I was in high school, everybody used to say, that's so gay, that's so gay, right? Not meaning to say something offensive, right? Well, at that moment when somebody's saying that's so gay, if you, your friend or your parent or your brother or whoever says, you know, don't say that word, that's not cool, right? Or I don't really understand what you mean by that context, right? Can you explain? Well, then that person's not going to start thinking that gay equals bad. And that prejudice doesn't get a chance to escalate. So we talk a lot about um, that everybody has the power to really speak up and, and, and check bias and make sure that it kind of progresses in a, in a positive way and doesn't get a chance to escalate into hate. Wait, okay, so now what's a, what's a hate crime? Sure. Um, what, what's the difference between a hate crime and a, and a, a non-hate crime? Yeah. So a hate crime is a criminal act that is very important piece here, and I'll come back mm -hmm. to that. It's a criminal act against a person or property who is intentionally selected for a number of characteristics. 
their race, ethnicity, disability, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion. Um, there has to be a crime. So a hate crime is not a standalone crime, but it's actually a penalty enhancement. So somebody commits a crime and it has a bias motivation, they get a hate crime added on to the criminal conviction. Um, so you have to have a crime, which is really important, and I'll tell you why, and you have to have a clear bias motivation. Now that bias motivation, um, there's two pieces of that that are important. One, the person has to be intentionally selected. So I have to commit a hate crime against you because I think you are Swedish, okay? It doesn't matter whether you're really Swedish or not. So hate crime statutes say, the, the victim is intentionally selected because of their actual or perceived gender, religion, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it doesn't matter if you're actually Swedish or not, but if I think you're Swedish and I come up and hit you and say, I hate Swedes, well, then that's a hate crime, right? Um, the, cr the, the criminal act piece is really important. And that's also a major differentiation between just like a hate incident or a bias motivated incident and a bias motivated crime. Um, Hate crimes is not trying to create this whole new class of crimes or trying to criminalize things that are not already crimes. So we hope that people do not think hateful things or say hateful things. But we also live in a country where free speech is incredibly important and is the hallmark to who we are. And so, you know, it is not a hate crime to say something bigoted. It is not a hate crime to think something bigoted. Is it a hate crime to act on that and commit a crime? Um, and that's really important because a lot of people um, get very concerned that hate crimes are going to be kind of unconstitutional and um, challenge uh, difference of opinion. So ADL led the push last year to get the Georgia State Legislature to pass hate crimes legislation. Yep. Why, why is that important? I mean, if you've committed, if the criminal act is the important, you, you know, as you said, you've got to have a criminal act. Yep. So the person has committed a criminal act, you know, assault, um, defacing a, a, a church, a synagogue. They've committed the criminal act. Why does the hate crime part added on make a difference? Sure. I mean, we can look at the incidents in Atlanta last week and see clear evidence of why a hate crime is different from a regular crime. The impact of a hate crime reverberates, is felt very wide to all people that share that identity characteristic. So, uh, I mean, for example, I have never been to Pittsburgh. I have never been to the Tree of Life Synagogue or to Squirrel Hill. I don't before that incident, I didn't even know anyone who had. Um, but when a deranged gunman goes into the Tree of Life synagogue and shoots up the synagogue, like my impulse is to install security cameras in my home, right? Mm -hmm. Is to hug my children really close, is to feel like I felt that fear and anxiety and alienation um, and, and helplessness too, right? Because hate crimes, one of the reasons they're so powerful is because the victims are powerless. They, they're chosen not because of what they did, but because of who they are. Um, and hate crimes specifically target certain categories that we call immutable characteristics. So things that you cannot or should not have to change about yourself, right? Um, and ADL actually argues pretty strongly against including other categories as protected categories in a hate crime like political ideology or um, professional categories, mm -hmm. because those are things that you can kind of take on and off, right? Those are things that uh, change over time, but you should not have to change your religion or your sexual orientation or your race um, because you live in fear because of that. And so giving something that hate crimes, um, reporting something as a hate crime, investigating something as a hate crime sends a clear message to communities that their identities matter and the things that they hold so precious are really important. We should also probably talk about why it took so long in Georgia to get a hate crimes bill passed. Um, 
if you don't mind me throwing that out there. Please. Um, I mean, in Georgia, we've been working on this for a very long time. And, you know, about a decade or so ago, we passed a bill that we knew wasn't going to pass constitutional muster. Um, and it took a long time to get it passed since then. And, you know, in all honesty, the real barrier in Georgia was sexual orientation and gender is protecting the rights of the LGBT community, which we insisted was kind of a major hallmark of the hate crimes bill and something that was kind of a non-negotiable. Okay, so you mentioned the crime, the murder last week of yep. eight people in Atlanta, yep. Metro Atlanta, seven of whom were women, six of whom were um, women of Asian descent. Is that a hate crime? Is that not a hate crime? Are there lawyers looking at this? I, I mean, I, let me know. I, I, yeah. I, I, told you, I told you an email. Friends of mine and I had a big discussion over dinner about this, you yeah. know, and, and it got pretty heated. Was that a hate crime? So, I mean, I should preface this by saying I believe in the importance of letting law enforcement do a thorough investigation and to really look into it, and they are. Um, they are um, really spending some time uh, to truly understand the motive and, 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 and the indicators um, of that crime. And, and I wanna give them the space to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think people in the community certainly feel the impact as if it was a hate crime. Yeah. So, and I think that's really important to recognize. So you're not making a decision. I mean, you're not, you, you're not expressing an opinion. I hope that it is investigated and reported as a hate crime. I want to wait and see what law enforcement find out. It's, it's too, it's too, I think it's still too early to tell. I agree with something that you kind of hinted at earlier that, you know, we can't necessarily trust the word of a deranged gunman. Um, so I'm not ready to <laughs> check off the box and say, yeah, no, he says it's not a hate crime. It's not a hate crime, right? Well, uh, well that was my next question. I mean, you, you yeah. talked about intent, but I imagine once you're arrested, part of your intent is to get, is to get off and, or if you're convicted to get the least possible sentence that, that, yeah. that you can get. So, you know, we, how do you determine in, intent of a crime and why would you believe what the perpetrator of the Trump yeah. does? So that's why I think that law enforcement investigation is really important and why we don't just trust a deranged gunman's words, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are a, <laughs> there's a laundry list of different potential indicators for hate crime. And so law enforcement are gonna spend a lot of time looking into this guy's, you know, social media footprint and his friends and family and his kind of cultural intake and trying to really understand who he was and what drove him to commit this crime. Um, you know, those are all really important questions. And that's why I think that investigation is really important and why we don't just kind of say, oh, he said it's not a hate crime, so no. Okay, well, you're not, you're not helping me settle the argument with my friends. <laughs> I mean, I think I think it should definitely be investigated as a hate crime. Okay. Yeah. What I mean, this, the, the 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 key point of the conversation is what can we do? What can the people on this uh, Zoom do? What can we as parents do? As neighbors? As relatives? How do we fight hate crimes? How do we fight prejudice? What what is it that that you and I can do? Well. I mean, I will say right now, I know we all feel a little bit kind of alone and in our dark circles at home, but we are more connected and there's more kind of energy around this than I can ever remember. I mean, so first of all, obviously the educate yourself and kind of stay informed, reaching out and supporting victims and communities and letting them know they're not alone. I, I mean, I, again, I was not personally impacted by the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting, um, but I did keep, and I still have, an, uh, a folder in my email of the, you know, hundreds or so of emails I received from friends and family just saying like, are you okay? How are you? I'm with you, right? Like those kinds of messages really, um, really have high impact when hmm. there's a hate crime. 
because hate crimes intentionally leave their victims feeling isolated and alienated. They, they are intended to instill fear in people because of who they are. And so, you know, showing solidarity and support is just really, really important. Um, there have been, you know, many, many different rallies and events showing all over the place. There are drives right now for collecting resources and uh, funds for the victims and their families. I mean, I think all of those are really important. I also think uh, the time in the pandemic has been a really interesting social experiment in uh, we've been kind of struggling through and we continue to struggle through the like proliferation of hate on social media, um, which is definitely a major concern, but we are also more connected and able to realize how much we can do via Zoom than ever before. And so I, I, I also think it's the time to kind of dig in and, um, and kind of find those connections and communities even more online. But before we go to questions, and let me yeah. remind people in the audience, please send your questions in using the question and answer function on the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. It says more, click on more, and the drop down will say Q&A. Click on that, and please send me your question. And short, shorter is better than longer, because it's easier for me to ask it. Um, Alice, what, you, you were talking about social media. And before the, 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 the public was allowed onto the Zoom. I mean, has social media aggravated, accelerated uh, hate crime? I mean, all these people who are, I, I'm a Twitter holic, I love Twitter, but there are all these people who don't use their names. Yeah. Um, who can say the most literally hateful, despicable things mm -hmm. without knowing who it is. I mean, is, is that has, has that aggravated the problem of, of prejudice, bias, and ultimately hate crime? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the role of social media is just undeniable. Um, I get asked this question a lot of kind of why do we see anti-Semitism and hate crimes and hatred kind of increasing these years? Is it all President Trump's fault? And no, it is not all President Trump's fault. Um, you know, a big major piece of this is the proliferation of, um, of hatred online. And, and frankly, the, the um, lack of accountability on social media platforms and the lack of response of social media platforms. Uh, last year, ADL launched a campaign with several major partners like the NAACP and LULAC and Color of Change, Sleeping Giants, uh, called Stop Hate for Profit, which was all about um, holding the social media companies um, accountable to the hate on their platforms and making them respond. And so kind of our first stage in this was pushing against Facebook on advertisements um, and trying to get them to um, take down hate and extremists from advertising because the algorithms were such that they would have, um, you know, kids on Facebook with, you know, a, a white supremacist group recruiting online, like popping up in their feed. Um, mm -hmm. And then we also pushed on Instagram a similar um, push. So we, ADL has been doing a lot of research on the kind of impact and research and, and, and actions of social media platforms. We've published reports and kind of graded them on who's doing the best job and who's doing the worst. Uh, actually, yesterday we released an online hate index kind of update of, of what the amount of hatred online is really looking like. Um, we cannot ignore the role that social media plays in all this. Um, it's pretty tremendous and they've got to step up and, and, and really respond. We were pleased, but it was kind of a little bit too little too late when um, Facebook and Twitter finally kind of took a stand after the insurrection. But I mean, it took an insurrection for that to happen. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. we've got some great questions. Let me, let me ask you some of these questions. Dwayne sure. Daly uh, asks, what are your thoughts about the need of a more coordinated approach to hate crimes? It, maybe a national organization efforts are clearly sure. yeah. uh, piecemeal. Uh, and frequently only address a special case or an individual group, one individual group. So, I mean, yep. you know, this group, that group, the other group, but not the phenomenon as a whole. Well, I uh, think the other piece that's really important 
important to talk about with that question is uh, the reporting of hate crimes, which yeah. is actually a, a very serious issue. So we, um, you know, right now we're working on getting every state in the country to just have a hate crimes law. Um, Georgia finally came off the list of the last five states in the nation that didn't have one for a long time. We're working right now on South Carolina and Wyoming and Arkansas. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have some movement there. Um, many states, their hate crimes laws are not comprehensive. So they may not, they may protect against race motivated hate crimes or religion motivated hate crimes, but not um, gender or sexual orientation or disability or gender identity. And so we really want um, all states have comprehensive hate crimes. But then once you have the law in the books, like are people actually using the law? Um, right. Law enforcement agencies are supposed to report hate crimes to the FBI with their um, uniform, uniform crime um, reporting. And um, la the last year of hate crimes data that we have available, um, there are many agencies that are not reporting hate crimes. Of all of the agencies that reported, only 14% are reporting hate crimes. We had 71 cities with 100,000 people or more report zero hate crimes. And we have, you know, a couple of dozen of cities who actually are not even reporting zero. They're kind of checking the box of do not report, like they don't want to participate. Um, so we're working a lot in educating law enforcement on hate crimes. And being very honest, I, I do a lot of law enforcement trainings on hate crimes. And when I teach them about it, they get it and they're excited about it and they understand why it's important. But I think we have some education to catch up on. And, and I'd love to see a little more of a coordinated federal response for accountability for reporting on hate crimes, um, accountability for training on hate crimes and resourcing to this issue. Who should lead that? I mean, is that an FBI responsibility? Is that a, you tell me who? who so it's a, how, how, do, how do we get that sort of? Yeah, the, there's a federal the, responsibility. Federal there's, a, um, there's a bill right now, the No Hate Act. It's the, um, the Khalid Jabara and Heather Heyer National Opposition to Hate, Assault and Threats to Equality. It's the No Hate Act, um, which is currently sitting in Congress and would um, increase accountability on reporting and training and resourcing to hate crimes and increase federal funding for it. Su Susan Hitchcock, who's a loyal audience member, comes to all of our programs, asks, how do we teach our children and grandchildren to speak mm -hmm. up when they have a classmate, a friend being bullied yeah. or spoken to in a, in a bigoted way? Yeah, so I think the first step is helping to make sure they recognize the hateful comment and, and know about it. Now, look, we've all been in situations where somebody says something and you freeze up and you're like, <gasps> and then you're kicking yourself and wishing you had said something earlier, right? I think with young people in particular, it's important to give them tools to do so uh, in their own language and in ways that's comfortable for them. So, you know, if somebody um, says a bigoted comment about, um, Chinese people in kindergarten, like we're not going to expect that kindergartner to stand up on their bully pulpit and give a whole diatribe about the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? Like they need to be comfortable with understanding that uh, the words they choose can have impact and there's many different ways to say things. So, um, you know, I, I teach my daughter to say, you know, that, that, that makes me uncomfortable. That's just, that's not cool, right? Like she's 11. She can find these words that when she says it, um, and I guess this piece is most important, the impact that we have is most pronounced on the people that love and respect us the most, right? So yeah. we can have the most impact with our family, our friends, our colleagues, right? It's a much harder conversation to speak to a teacher or a superior of some sort, right? But kids can have the most impact with their fellow kids, right? Mm -hmm. If they say that's not cool, well, then their friend's gonna be like, oh, well, I wanna be cool. I'm not gonna do that, right? Um, so we can all have that impact. And I think we all have the responsibility um, to have that kind of arsenal of words in our back pocket that we can say when somebody says something uh, and to not feel the pressure to know the whole historical significance. I mean, we should all know the whole historical significance of these things, especially as adults, but if we don't, um, we still need to be able to speak out and voice opposition. So um, 
we still need to say like, what do you mean by that? At ADL, we do a lot of um, anti-bias trainings in schools and with corporations and community groups. And um, we kind of, one of our ground rules from the beginning is we let people say, ouch, right? Like just ouch. When something, somebody says that maybe they didn't mean to say it in those words, or maybe they did, somebody just yells, you know, ouch, right? Like they're like, oh, wait, I got to pause and rethink. Um, and I think it's important to constantly call it out and make people rethink those words that they're using, even for young kids. Somebody should have said that to the sheriff from Cherokee County yes. in the press conference, right? Yes, absolutely. That, that was a huge ouch. Well, uh, Susan, I'll also ask, do you have any comments on what we know so far about the, 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 the supermarket in Boulder and the young man who was 10 people were killed there? Yeah, no, I mean, it's... Um, I mean, we're still, we still have a lot to understand about what happened in Colorado, right? I mean, we still have a lot to understand what happened in Atlanta. Um, it's still too early. It's, it's interesting though, we, um, oh, ADL does a, we, we do a murder and extremism report every year where we look at um, the kind of extremist related murders of the past decade and what motivated them, what's the ideology. And I was looking at last year's data pretty recently and we didn't have any major mass shootings last year, partially possibly because of the pandemic. And so having two within a week is just, I know, I think for all of us, it's just a really tremendous kind of emotional and mental burden that we're dealing with. And for the communities impacted, I mean, in Colorado, they've had a lot of mass shootings over the years. It's just very, very traumatic. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I was talking about earlier in, in terms of that solidarity, I think these are the times where that really matters when we are already so full of anxiety and distance based on the pandemic. Like these are the moments when our outreach even means more. Um, yeah, and, and I, I'm eager to kind of learn more about what happened and, and what the motive was. Hey, Amy Baxter asks, has the purpose of designating a hate crime changed over time? I don't think so. I mean, I think um, hate crimes have existed for a long time. I, I think maybe some of the ways we use them have changed over time, especially as we see social media kind of develop and grow. Um, but I think these things that have motivated um, kind of bias and have motivated us in crime, you know, they've been around for a long time. And, you know, I think it's to actually we talk about the data a little bit, um, because I think that's telling here, you know, year after year, without fail, um, race is the largest category of bias motivated crimes by far, year after year, by far. And year after year, by far, African-Americans are the largest targeted group by hate crimes, like period. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what we expect to be a trend historically in the US from before we started collecting hate crimes data. Um, you know, we also see large increases. Um, we saw a large increase in anti-Jewish hate crimes that occupied about 60% of religious motivated hate crimes. We saw large increases in anti-Hispanic hate crimes. We saw large increases in anti-Arab hate crimes. Um, and we saw a huge spike in anti-gender identity, anti-trans hate crimes, um, which kind of follows along with some of our um, national dialogue here. So, um, you know, I think the data shows some consistency, but also um, shows that some of these issues have been around forever. Franklin Hope asks, how, how does a hate crime conviction affect the sentence for violent crimes like murder? Yeah. Do you think it, it is a deterrent? No, I don't think it's a deterrent. Um, I mean, and we could talk about the same in the case of every sentencing, right? I mean, a sentence for a domestic, um, a domestic violence dispute is not going to deter somebody from beating up their wife or husband. Um, the sentencing varies state to state. Um, and it, it, so that's one of those, one of, I forgot who asked the question earlier about kind of coordinating things a little more. Um, the sentencing does vary state to state. And 
um, in Georgia, if Long is convicted of a hate crime, it would add two years onto his sentence, which mm -hmm. he's talking about, you know, a lifetime conviction, I'd imagine. So right. a two year sentence addition is not necessarily gonna like break the bank here. I think what it is gonna do is send a very clear message to communities, um, whether that be women, whether that be Asian Americans, whether that be Asian American women, or whether it be kind of any marginalized people who have been feeling under attack and struggling with this, that, you know, that hate crimes matter and their identities matter. Okay, Eddie, I'm gonna to get to your question in, in a minute. I'm not ignoring you, but uh, Jennifer McCoy has got a question that sort of follows right on what you're talking about. Yeah. If a person targets only a subcategory of a group, that is Asian women, mm -hmm. whom the gunman believes tempt him, mm -hmm. it can still be considered a hate crime, correct? That was she asked. I'm, I'm, dehumanization of even that subgroup seems to seems key to identifying motive as well as rehabilitation techniques. Yeah. You said Jennifer McCoy asked that question? Yeah. Good. It was a good question, Jennifer. Um, I think so. Yes. Uh, law, the law enforcement investigation and the prosecutors are going to look at the race motivation and the gender motivation, right? because those are the two categories. Now, somebody could commit a hate crime with more than one category. That's a possibility here, right? Um, the question is about the race, the race category, which I think is a very uh, important and interesting question is, you know, he says he has nothing against Asian Americans. He says, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we as a nation or we as a, you know, larger community have been dehumanizing Asian American women and kind of hypersexualizing them uh, for many years. And how much did that contribute to him thinking that Asian women are his targets, right? Was that motivated by a racial, um, a definition of race in his mind that motivated him to commit these crimes based on race? Um, so I think that's kind of a tricky question for law enforcement to be looking into. Uh, from an outsider, you know, on face value, it certainly seems that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Addie, I'm, here, here's your question. I'll follow, thank you for your patience. This is from Addie Olson. Do you have advice on how to have conversation with people who cite religious reasons for their biased beliefs? Mm. That is a tough one. Um, I would rather give advice on uh, how to have conversations that cite religious reasons for being against hate crimes legislation, right? Because I'm not sure I am the expert to tell somebody, you know, what their religion teaches or not teaches and how they should kind of guide through that. But I have dealt with a lot of people who say my religious beliefs demand that, you know, I cannot support the LGBT community, for example, those types of things, right? Um, so if a couple of pieces I think here is, first of all, we are talking about crimes, <laughs> like we are talking about existing crimes and just recognizing the bias motivation to it. Um, mm -hmm. We are not trying to create a whole new group of crimes. We are not saying that, you know, the the Jewish rabbi who said something bigoted from the pulpit in their synagogue uh, should be charged with a hate crime, right? Saying bigoted things is not a crime. Um, we wish that Jewish rabbi didn't say that thing, but who knows, right? Um, and we can talk to them and try to confront that, um, but a, a hate crime is different. We are talking about crimes. We are not creating a new class of crimes. Um, and I think that when, you know, when I talk to people who struggle for religious motivations to um, support the LGBT community, there's a difference between supporting the LGBT community, which I do think everybody should be doing, versus protecting the LGBT community from crimes, right? This is a recognition that uh, their identity matters, whether you agree with it or not. And that that peace should be respected and, and they should be safe to be who they are. Hmm. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, 
I'm, I'm glad we're recording this <laughs> so I can watch this again. This is a, a oh. question from, from Laura Duncan. What, what's a good way to respond to people who argue that you're just trying to cancel them oh. when, when the goal is asking them to simply reflect on the harm their statements may have caused? Yeah. Great question. Can I add one more piece to the other question first and then come back, which is, sure. um, I also think it's important to recognize uh, that hate crimes are not uh, only protecting marginalized communities. So hate crimes protect everyone, no matter who they are, based on their identity. So we have uh, race motivated hate crimes targeting white people. We have religion motivated hate crimes targeting Christians. We have gender motivated hate crimes targeting men. Actually, 25% of gender motivated hate crimes target men. We have sexual orientation motivated hate crimes targeting the cisgender. So hate crimes is really about protecting identities as a whole and trying to create the America that I think we all believe in, which is one where people should be free to be who they are and feel safe doing so. Um, so uh, back to this question about um, people worrying about feeling canceled, right? Uh, I think um, coming back to Ambassador Shapiro's uh, obsession with Twitter, like it is hard to not go on social media these days and hear some of the videos or watch some of the statements from people who, you know, knew the victims members of the community attended a rally and not feel their pain. And I think that pain is the thing that we are, that pain, that trauma, that anger, that is the thing that we need to recognize. We don't need to decide whether that anger is valid or not, right? Like that's a totally different question, I think. But I, you know, we, we talked earlier about kind of impact, intent versus impact. So whether or not Long intended to create, to commit a hate crime or not, which law enforcement is looking into, the impact is that a community is feeling targeted. <laughs> they are feeling targeted and scared and, and worried, right? Just like many of us have felt, I think over the past few years when we've seen many mass hate crimes, whether it be El Paso or Christchurch or Pittsburgh, right? We have had um, kind of a, a couple of years of mass attacks on marginalized people of all kinds. And we can see kind of a through line through all of these and understanding how important our identities are to one another. And so, you know, if I were talking with somebody who was worried about that, I would, you know, ask them to, like Brian Stevenson always calls like, you know, get proximate right? Understand who you're concerned about, understand what they're feeling, um, and show up and, and learn. Hmm, that's great. Allison, I, I want to thank you so much. This is yeah. just terrific 45 minutes, and uh, uh -huh. it is because the, no, the number of participants has not dropped. Usually they start to drop off, <laughs> but everybody's glued to their computers. Um, this, I mean, I could just keep going longer I, I you know part of me is so naive i was surprised at charlottesville by the youth of those people yeah. i mean somehow i think of you know white supremacists and nazis as being you know old guys in overalls and yeah. not young men in khakis and golf shirts yeah. and yeah you know i mean i think it was a really important wake-up call and important for us here in Atlanta too, uh, you know, the white supremacists are no longer the, you know, image of somebody in their basement kind of planning something around a Confederate flag, right? Um, Atlanta actually hosted a conference. I don't mean to, those are the wrong words. Atlanta did not host the conference. Um, a major alt-right group had their conference here in Atlanta shortly after Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you look at a picture from their conference, I mean, you would think you were looking at like a college alumni group or a fraternity group. It was just, um, it is a very different vision of what that hatred is, which I think is all the more reason why it is incumbent upon all of us, no matter who we are and what community we live in, to 
speak up and stand up to hate and to make sure we are keeping our loved ones in check. That's great. Allison, thank you so much. I, we're going to we send an email out to everybody who has registered for the program, and we will include in that the link to the YouTube of our conversation today. But we'll also include your website at the ADL so people can go and look further and get information. Um, also, I'm going to send, I, I include, because I recommend this to everybody, on Netflix, there's a documentary called Amend. Uh, which is actually the, the narrator is Will Smith. It's I think five or six installments, um, one of which is entirely about, it's about the 14th Amendment, mm. equal justice under law, right? And one of the entire segments is about hate crimes and the history of hatred against Asian Americans. Mm. Um, and it, it's really, it's, it's, it's worth watching. And also the New York Times today has an article about the, the, the killings here in Atlanta and contrasting the owner of the spa with the workers in the spa. Oh. And I mean, just, it's just, just fascinating. So yeah. we'll send this to everybody. Thank you, Allison. Thank you to the UPS Foundation for sponsoring this. We couldn't do this without them. We've got a program tonight, if you're under 35, and I am not, um, on with a career coach, Ariel Lopez, and it's how to negotiate and network up online in a virtual world. On Tuesday of next week, we've got a program on the post-COVID economy with Rafael Bostic, who is the, we all know, is the president CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. And the moderator will not be me, it will be Dennis Lockhart, former president CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. I've got three requests for all of y'all. Number one, if you're not a member, please join the World Affairs Council. Number two, for all of y'all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's no charge, it's free. Subscribe sounds like it requires money, but it doesn't. And you, that's how you can catch the, the, the programs that you are unable to attend. And finally, please invite your friends to join one of our programs. We'd love to have them. Thank you to Valorin Lopez de Frank, our producer, Laura Brower, assistant producer, Fernanda Lucchini Shihada, the council's executive director. Thank you again, Allison, and to you and everybody else out there. Hag Pesach Sameach. Hope everybody has a, a, a great Passover this weekend and Easter next weekend. Thank you, Allison. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach. Bye bye.